like most parents, my parents wanted me to be happy, be successful, get married, have children, lead a pretty normal kind of life. And I've had a good try. <laughs> explored many different things. I remember putting my mother through hell, actually, when she was doing the washing, and I used to come at her with questions like, how big is the universe? <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> why was I born in my, my body and not in my brother's body? <laughs> things like this. I guess every child has these, these questions which come up, and and they never stop asking why. This deep feeling of wanting to find something in life which was really substantial and worthwhile has been a kind of undertone throughout the whole of my later years. People must wonder why I would ordain as a Buddhist monk and uh, what it's like to, to live in this way if, if it if it's, uh, has any different quality to it than, say, living as a layman. My reason for taking on this lifestyle is to live in a way that I find that I can really respect myself. We use arm tools, not for fun, not for pleasure, not for fattening, not for beautification. The life is one based on being totally harmless, living with others in a way that is respectful and would allow me to live the rest of my life in a more skillful and useful way than the way I was doing it. I think my family has been a little puzzled by my decision to move in this direction. It's not what every parent would like for their child. It's something rather strange, a strange religious form. One shaves one's head, one follows some strange conventions, dresses in a strange way, and just by looking at the appearances, it's very difficult to understand what's going on. One cannot really develop deeply in meditation if one is doing things in one's life which involve guilt, remorse, disturbance, misusing and mistreating other people, because the effects of these on the mind, is, it always comes back at you. The guidelines are very, very helpful about um, just practical living, so one is taught not to, not to kill things, not to steal, not to lie, this kind of thing, and to live in a wholesome way. It's odd because here I am just about to take ordination as a Buddhist monk and yet I'm almost a bit reluctant to call myself a Buddhist because one uses Buddhist practice and the theory as a way of investigating. One always has this attitude of let's investigate, let's try, let's look. My sisters and my brother are very supportive and my brother has actually has taken a meditation retreat and he stayed at the monastery they've all stayed at the monastery now my brother's studied meditation quite deeply and and he's very interested too the lay community offers them their robes and their alms bowl so when these are presented to you you feel that you have to really be worthy of these offerings. At university studying psychology, my hope was to learn to understand human beings better, and hence, I guess, to understand myself and the world better. And one of the avenues that became available was the prospect of learning how to meditate. Just after I completed my degree, I took a and a meditation course where one would sit still in silence hour after hour the entire 10-day period would be in silence eat one meal a day i found it a very very difficult thing 
wanted to leave several times, but managed to maintain the intention to stick it out. It was quite a test of endurance. But I was introduced on this course to the Buddhist teachings, and that interest developed and deepened over the next few years. I'm very glad I really had a strong intention at that stage because I had the opportunity to observe something very profound. And that is, when desire arises, it passes away. And the desire to leave arose several times. And rather than acting on it and being halfway down the drive before I realized it, I would just sit and sit and sit with it, kind of almost shaking sometimes with the the desire to leave, and each time it would gradually subside and pass. And each time it passed, I would just feel so incredibly peaceful. So each time I could see that, it would give me a sense of confidence in just continuing. Now this is the very essence, really, of Buddhist practice. Your Buddhist name now will be Vipassi, and the name of your Upachara is my name, Sumito. So when they ask you what your name is, <coughs> you, know, you say Vipassi. When you ask who your Upachara is, you say Sumito. Can you remember that? I think so. Okay. Vipassi was one of the Buddhas. <laughs> It's a very honorable name. <laughs> Look at that, it's even showering. See, even a blessing, blessing from the Deva. I spent the first year of my life as a bhikkhu at Chidhurst under the guidance of Venerable Ajahn Anando, one of the senior monks in our order. Chidhurst being a place where it's very peaceful and ideally suited to the training of new monks. Okay, let's get on with the other one. Yes. I moved here after my first year there to uh, Amrawati, which is more of a teaching center, um, much busier in many respects. Uh, I think so, because it's, it's really straightforward. Yeah. Are we going to take it out of the crate? I think not for right now. It's much easier to, uh, to move in the crate. It's possible to reverse it like that. Well, that's what I'm saying. Oh, which way are you going to go? That way, or are you going to have that in? Uh, well, we want to put his, the base, the feet down. Yes. We don't want to have him do a headstand. <laughs> of course, I wasn't thinking. We hold a lot of different activities, uh, meditation classes and workshops, Let's teaching children about Buddhism. All right. The whole feeling here is much more wide open. Just gently now, see what Can we move the trolley down? All right. All right? Yeah. Okay. When the uh, monks first came to live in England, our teacher in Thailand, Ajahn Chah, urged Ajahn Sumedho to insist that everyone went out every day on arms round. This is the traditional way of gathering food in Thailand. I think Ajahn Chah probably realized that it was unlikely that the monks would be supported in this way in England. But he realized that there was a stronger symbolic significance in this as well, that just by going out every day, we would gradually attract interest. And he called it flying the Buddhist flag we keep our eyes downcast and just move silently along the street. Occasionally we get a few cat calls, but people are getting to know a bit more about what Buddhist monks are about and what they look like. As I have some skills in, in carpentry work, I came up to help with the conversion of some of the large wooden buildings that we have. This used to be a school. Some of the large dormitories were converting into smaller living units for the monks. Now, the last time we uh, we actually touched the size of the plane, we're just going to set it up and take it out again.
Yeah, no, well, we've done all that, oh, right. so it's ready to be fixed. Uh -huh. This situation we've, where the Sangha is in a, like its establishment phase necessitates the fact that the, the bhikkhus have to be involved far more than is desirable in the, in the building side of things. In Thailand, where things are very well established, a lot of the work would actually be taken care of by contractors or, or lay people generally. Ajahn Sumedho has been very concerned to guide us in such a way that we use the actual experience of working on the site as a way of extending our meditation practice rather than thinking, oh, this area is, is meditation practice when we're sitting and meditating and the other is the work. This afternoon I thought I would address you on the importance of monastic discipline. Because now that you've taken the ordination, the, the precepts, uh, the responsibility of a Buddhist monk, a bhikkhu, then this implies that now you're training yourself in a way of restraint. Uh, Having a teacher of the uh, stature and wisdom of Ajahn Sumedho is a great source of strength for us all. He teaches by his own personal example, an example of what this life leads toward. The Patimokha discipline, you are expected to learn, memorize all 227 rules in this ancient Pali language. Uh, and this, of course, is we recommend doing within the first five years of your monastic training, so that this becomes ingrained in your mind, this, this whole discipline. That's the only way we can really live with each other for very long, is by living under a common discipline. Because if each one of us did exactly as we wanted to do, we'd end up quarreling and fighting. It seems to me it's, it's very early days in my monastic career as yet. One doesn't really expect to experience drastic changes very quickly. There is a very gradual, almost imperceptible unfolding of a, the process of awakening. Things which used to irritate and frustrate before now no longer seem to have the power to do so. The open-heartedness that comes from meditation allows these things to be as they are and then to pass in their own time. And this attitude very much develops in a, in a social sense as well, that, that the people with whom one is living, one develops a great sense of acceptance towards, a tolerance towards. And even if somebody is having a very difficult time, going through quite a, a, a strong emotional crisis, say, where their behavior can be quite disruptive, then one can still just gently accept and, uh, and, and allow this to be, rather than finding oneself caught up in a reaction against it. Here in this country, as Buddhist monks and nuns, what I hope our presence will be for this society is one of helping to bring it together, to provide more opportunities for reflection and for people to learn how to live in a cooperative and respectful way with each other.